Hi, Pastor Rob here. Just wanted to say thank you for all of your love and support here at the Bridge Church. I know many of you are visiting our website right now to maybe catch up on some sermons over the past weeks, or uh, maybe some of you are checking us out for the very first time, and we would just want to do everything we can to help you connect with God. Here at the Bridge Church, we believe it's our job to do exactly that. Connect people to God, and the best way we can do that is by connecting with you. So uh, we just wanted to let you know before you watch this message today, uh, our hope is that you would find your own faith community where wherever you're at, whether that be here in our corner of Northeast Iowa, maybe you can connect with us, uh, or, or wherever else you may be. Uh, connecting to a community is vitally important to your spiritual growth. So as happy as we are that you're using our online resources, our prayer and our hope is that you're able to find a faith community of your own, that you might be able to learn and grow and, and build yourself up spiritually and have others do that for you as well. So if, you, uh, if, if you're watching this for the very first time, uh, we pray that you're encouraged. We pray that, we pray that you're built up in, in your faith. And, uh, and we pray that you do exactly as the Apostle Paul has called you to do in the book of Hebrews, and that is to not give up meaning together. Thank you so much, and God bless. Well, when I was growing up in the church, uh, my pastor always used to say something, and maybe you'll be able to respond, okay? He used to say, he is risen. There you go. Let's try it again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Man, we're so glad that you made it here to celebrate that our risen Savior with us. And, and, and man, if you're new with us, uh, I was serious about that four-week challenge. Man, we just want to do everything we can to connect you to God. And, and I know many of you, maybe you go to church on and off. Maybe you just come to church on Christmas and Easter. I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're, you're sitting here going, you know what? I'm not even sure if I believe in that guy named Jesus, and, and I'm still trying to figure that out. Hey, we want you to know this is a safe place to wrestle, Okay. This is a safe place to wrestle. This is a safe place for you to search. It's okay for you to walk into this building and go, I don't believe in Jesus. That's fine. We love you. We just ask that you give them a chance, okay? So if you're new with us today, man, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, we tr try to do everything we can to welcome you on Sunday mornings, and we just want to challenge you. Just, hey, over the next four weeks, give, <laughs> get, give Jesus a shot. Give the Bridge Church a shot and just see what God can do in your life, okay? I promise you that you will not regret uh, uh, the next four weeks if you're willing to take that challenge. So, like I said, today we're, today is Easter, right? We all know why we're here. And uh, today I want to talk about uh, uh, the resurrected Son of Jesus Christ. I know you're all shocked that that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, uh, but I want to start by talking about something that I witnessed just last week, and I think it's one of the coolest stories within all of sports, and that is Tiger Masters won the Masters, right? Or Tiger Woods won the Masters, right? Tiger Masters won the Masters. Oh my gosh. Hold on a second. Let me reset. You are so, oh my gosh, what is wrong? Okay, we're good. All right. <laughs> Tiger Woods won the Masters, okay? And uh, yeah, there we go. All right. And uh, it was just a really, really powerful moment, wasn't it? Like, for those of you that don't even follow golf, you're like, okay, I heard about it, and that's pretty cool, right? Uh, and, and the coolest thing about it was uh, they showed on ESPN a number of images, the most of which was him running to his son to hug him after he won, right? He'd been containing himself the whole tournament. He was composed. He wasn't jumping. He wasn't excited. He wasn't anything other than just really just focused, right? It was like he, he was so laser-focused, he would have pierced the whole tournament if he looked at you, all right? But then he won and everything just exploded, right? I mean, he just could not contain himself and he ran to his son and gave him a hug. And what was so powerful about that was immediately following, they would show images of him hugging his own father 20 years ago when he won his very first master's tournament. And the reason that's so powerful is because his dad has since passed on. And for the last 10 to 12 years, Tiger has been trying to win another major tournament in front of his kids. He just wanted them to be able to experience that with him, right? Now, here's the question that I asked myself, and, and that's that, why was this so incredible, right? Why was Tiger's um, story so incredible? I, because the fact of the matter was, this was his 15th major. So, I, I mean, when you look at it in those eyes, you're like, he's done this 15 times. Why was it such a big deal, right? And not only that, was it not only his 15th major that he'd ever won, but it was not just his first green jacket. It was his fifth green jacket. And, and, and he was just overwhelmed with joy. And some people that I know that watched the tournament said they didn't have a dry eye in the room, right? 
So it wasn't the fact that it was his 15th major. It it wasn't the fact that it was his fifth jacket. It wasn't even the fact that he did it at the age of 43. What was it that made it such an incredible story? It was the comeback, right? It was the comeback that made it so absolutely incredible. You see, Tiger won his first major golf tournament back in 97, and and much of his reign over the golf world came about 10 to 12 years immediately following. Um, Tiger was an absolute phenom, wasn't he? Right? Like, uh, even today, when Tiger's playing, TV, TV ratings skyrocket, don't they? They just go up. A lot of people say that he's like the Michael Jordan of golf. Even if you don't follow the sport, you probably know who he is, or at least who he was. Because Tiger's career and his his reign over the sport of golf came to a crashing halt in 2009, didn't it? That year, reports say that Tiger was found by police police officers semi-conscious and bleeding from the head after his car had bounced off of a fire hydrant and gone and slammed into a tree right in front of his Florida home. It would later come out that Tiger had had a series, not one, but a series of uh, extramarital uh, affairs that led his wife of seven years to divorce him. Not only that, though, his career would take a huge hit after having multiple unsuccessful back surgeries over the next four years. Tiger was beginning to fall in a way that no one could have imagined. In 2016, he would eventually announce that he would not be able to compete in the U.S. Open, and less than a year later, he would, begin, he would once again be found in his car, only this time he would be caught driving under the influence in 2017. And he would also miss the first cut in the PGA Tour event in almost two years. The world witnessed the fall of Tiger in a pretty raw way, didn't it? He went from number one in the world in the golf rankings to number 1,199. You'd think he really couldn't fall much further. He wasn't just losing tournaments. He was losing his life. But then... And and, uh, a a few years ago, uh, he finally had a successful back surgery and Tiger would begin the climb again, right? He wasn't just showing up to tournaments anymore. He was competing in them again. That image of him on his knees on the golf course was long gone and now he was looking ahead. And now he was beginning to compete so much so that at the end of uh, 2018, he was the runner-up of the US PGA Championship. He finished tied sixth for the Open, which are two major golf tournaments, before recording his first tur- tournament victory in five years when he won the Tour Championship. And then just a week ago, Tiger won the Masters. Tiger won the Masters, and, and, and he could not contain himself, and Holmes could not contain themselves, and people were crying even though you don't know him, okay? I'm not admitting anything at this moment in time. We all love a comeback story, though, don't we? We all love a comeback story. If you think about it, most of the entertainment that we watch is surrounded around a lot of comeback stories, whether it be the comeback in a love story the comeback in a superhero story or the comeback in a real life true story, right? Number one thing that comes to mind for me in entertainment today is probably the Marvel and superhero movies. Okay, I'm kind of a nerd, okay, so I love those things. Who's ready for Avengers? Yeah, oh yeah. Stephanie and I got tickets. We're going at 10 o'clock at night on Thursday. Who wants to watch my kids? Yeah, look at that. Oh, dude, the pastor card wins again. So anyways, uh, we're, uh, I think of the Marvel and superhero movies when it comes to the comeback, right? Think about it. How many of the Marvel and superhero movies, they get their powers, they discover them, they figure them out, right? And then they start to rise and they start, you know, keeping all these crimes from happening and doing all these good things. When really, if I had superpowers, I'd be doing a lot more than just that, right? Amen? Can I get an amen? Yeah. Okay. But they start, you know, solving all these crimes and getting rid of all these criminals and the, the, you see the jail cells that are full of criminals, right? And they're just cleaning up the streets. But then the villain shows up, doesn't he? The villain shows up and, and, and you're the hero encounters something they never have before. And, and, and what happens is they fall and they fall as far as they possibly can. And just when you think things cannot get any worse, something happens. And, and the comeback begins, doesn't it? That's the climax of the movie is when things couldn't possibly be, be any worse. And yet the hero rises. 
The hero rises. We don't just like it in the movies, though. We like the comeback story in all of life. We're addicted to the comeback story in all of life. Think about all the news stories and the inspirational ESPN moments they have. And, and the, 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 the news stories on 60 Minutes where they just talk about this incredible comeback, this person that defeated all the odds, that made it past poverty, that made it past the disease, that was able to overcome that terminal illness and go into remission when, when the doctor said, you'll be dead in a month. We're addicted to it. We love it. Maybe for some of you today, you're saying, man, I could really use a comeback story. You see where I'm going with this. We all know why we're here. Today we're going to talk about the greatest comeback story of all time. We're going to look at the story of Jesus, the, the, the comeback, the resurrection, the redemption, the fact that Jesus wasn't, sold, wasn't sealed in the grave, but that he was risen again. Amen? That's why we're here. We're here to celebrate a resurrected Savior, to party, to live it out, to smile, to stuff ourselves with donuts and coffee and celebrate Jesus. Amen? Amen. Yeah, no, you know, know what I'm talking about. I haven't got my long john yet, but it's coming. <laughs> we are here to celebrate, man, and I'm, ex I'm so ecstatic that you made it. But as we look at this resurrection story today, I want you to do, do yourself a favor and do me a favor. I want you to try and look at it with fresh eyes, Okay? Because I imagine that many of you that are here today have heard this story a number of times. And you came to Easter service today and you're going, okay, I'm ready for my resurrection message. I've heard it. I heard it last year and the year before and the year before I was raised in the church. I've heard this story. But I want you to look at it with fresh eyes because I think this story is the foundation of everything that we ask and hope for in our own lives. I think that's why we crave it so much in entertainment. I think that's why we cry about it whenever we see somebody like Tiger. I think that's why we, we crave those inspirational moments during uh, the ESPN specials or, whether, or during 60 Minutes or whatever news uh, outlet you watch. We love the comeback. And I think that comeback is rooted in Jesus. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 23. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd encourage you to go ahead and grab those now. Um, if you don't have a Bible with you or you don't have an app for that, go ahead and grab one of those black Bibles from the chair racks in front of you. And if you're new with us and you would say, man, I don't even have a Bible, take that thing home with you. That is our gift to you. We would, happy, we would be so happy to give that to you. But um, today we're going to be in Luke chapter 23. If you don't know how to get there, I'm going to help you. Don't worry. Okay, so you're going to take your Bible and you're going to split it about two-thirds to three-quarters of the way. And you'll probably land in Matthew, Mark, or... Luke, right? If you've hit John, Acts, or Romans, you've gone too far. As you turn there, um, I want to kind of give you some context. This is what you need to know. Jesus' last supper is long over, okay? Jesus' last supper is long over. He told the disciples that he eagerly awaited the time when they would have this last moment together. And, and, and at this last supper, Jesus would actually wash the disciples' feet, he would surrender himself over to become the lowliest of servants, even that of a slave, and he would wash the disciples' feet. At this supper, he would break bread with them. He would feast with them. He would love on them. And at this supper, he would pray with them, and he would even pray over you. That's right. Jesus prayed for you. He prayed for future generations to come that, know Jesus, that they might come to know Jesus Christ and be strong in the faith. Later that night, he would, be, he would continue to pray on his own in the Garden of Gethsemane. And eventually, he would be turned over to the religious leaders and unfairly accused and tried. He would then be turned over to the Romans. He would be brought before Herod. He would be brought before Pilate. And then he would be condemned by the people to be crucified over the likes of a mass murderer named Barabbas. The Roman guard would be uh, given the responsibility to see his crucifixion to completion. You see, the religious leaders didn't want to have Jesus' blood on their hands, did they? They didn't want to have Jesus' blood on their hands, so they said, we're not going to kill him, we'll let the Romans do it. So they tried to wash their hands of Jesus' death by handing Jesus over to them. Then Herod would try to wash his hands of Jesus' death by giving the decision back to Pilate. And then Pilate would literally... He would literally wash his hands of Jesus' death by allowing the people to decide Jesus' fate. But here's the thing. For those of us that believe, for those of us that know the story, we know that none of us have clean hands, do we? 
None of us have clean hands when it comes to Jesus' death. You see, the Bible says that, that for all have fallen short of the glory of God, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means I don't have to teach you to sin. I don't have to teach my kids to punch each other in the face, okay? I just don't have to do it. They already know it. That means we're all sinful from the day we were born. We're all broken. We all need Jesus, amen? amen. Look at your neighbor and say, y'all need Jesus. We all need Jesus. I said one, one sentence, that's all you get. None of us are innocent. And as we approach Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 50, we see that Jesus has been crucified and, and, and has passed on. According to the book of Luke, Jesus' last words were that of surrender. Father, into your hands I now commit my spirit. And with that, Jesus breathed his last. And now the time had come for his burial. So let's just pick things up in Luke chapter 23. We're going to be right in verse 50, okay? Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the, the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to the decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one which had, no one had yet been laid. In other words, it was a fresh tomb. Jesus was by himself. It was the preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The Sabbath was a day of rest. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. Jesus was dead. No one doubts this. Even the history books say that, that Jesus died, that there was a man who was crucified on the cross by the Romans that was killed for his beliefs and for his crimes against the Jews. And because of his death, the apostles were lost. Jesus was gone. He had been leading them for about three years now, and they didn't know what to do. Their hero had fallen. Where do we go now? What are we supposed to do? Should we hide? They killed him. Yeah, I, they'll probably kill us. And yet Jesus knew this day would come. And Jesus didn't just know it. He told them about it over and over and over again. And they still didn't believe. Well, a couple of wealthy religious leaders that voted against Jesus' death decided, hey, hey, we, they, they were actually part of the council that, that, that voted for Jesus to die, but they voted against his death. And they decided, you know what? The best we can do is give him a proper burial. So they asked Pilate for the body, and they pulled Jesus off of the cross, and they, they, they take him to a tomb, a fresh tomb that no one had been placed in yet. They get the women together, and they say, hey, get some spices and perfumes ready. We're going we're gonna to make sure the body's well-preserved. We're going to make sure that this is a, a, a really good, proper burial for, for Jesus. We want to do everything we can to honor him. And the women actually witness Jesus being laid in the tomb. And then we can pick things up in Luke 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. You see, they had to wait for the Sabbath before they could do this. They had to get through the Sabbath. Jesus was crucified on, on Friday, and the Sabbath was on Saturday. So they had to be quick about the burial, and then they had to get him in the tomb, and they weren't able to put the spices and perfume on him until later. Let's keep reading. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Verse 3, but when they entered, Jesus did not find, or excuse me, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that, that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still you, with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered 
over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. They then remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 apostles and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others who told this to the, the apostles, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, however got up and he ran to the tomb. I like to say that Peter, who was closest to Jesus, probably ran as fast as he could, don't you think? He ran to the tomb, bending over. He saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what happened. So the Marys and Joseph, they returned to the tomb with spices and oils to keep the body well preserved, and as they approached the tomb, they expected to find the same body they witnessed laid there. They expected to continue to mourn. They expected to return to the aftermath of the horrific tragedy they witnessed just days before. And yet, that is far from what they found. They found a stone that had been rolled away. And the only thing they found inside of that tomb were strips of linen, burial cloth that were laying by themselves. And that's when the miraculous took place, right? Because two angels approached them and they asked them this really profound question that I think God is challenging us to ask ourselves today. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Don't you remember? He told you about this. You spent all that time with him and you're still confused? He said, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinners, be crucified on the third day, raised again. You should know this stuff. He talked about it time and time and time again. Why are you still searching? You know, maybe some of us are sitting here going, why didn't the disciples believe? Why didn't the women believe? Why didn't they understand immediately when Jesus talked about it so much? They'd seen Jesus perform all these miracles. They couldn't believe this. Here's the thing. Jesus is the only one that's ever defeated death. Amen? Amen. Outside of him, death is undefeated. So, so when I sit there and think about that, I'm like, well, yeah, I probably would have doubted too. I would have been just as confused. The last 48 hours to, you know, you know 72 hours of their lives were absolute H-E double hockey sticks. I mean, they didn't know what was happening. They didn't know what was going on. They just witnessed the most horrific tragedy they'd ever had experienced in their entire lives. Of course they were doubting. I say this just about every Easter. It's easy to believe that Jesus died. It's something different to believe that he was resurrected from the grave. You see... Christianity isn't based on a death. It's based on a resurrection, amen? It's based on a resurrection. That's why I'm always confused over the fact that the Christian symbol of hope is a Roman torture device. That which represents death. Because Jesus isn't there anymore, amen? Amen? This is, a, this is that which represents death. And, and I think everyone in the world can believe that Jesus died. I think that's the easy part. The question is whether or not he was raised. You see, in the, in the book of John, we see that Jesus said, I am the resurrection. I am the what? Resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even though they die, will live even though they die, excuse me. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. They will never die. Do you believe that this morning? Jesus came to bring life, not death. He experienced death that we might be given life. And yet I fear that so many of us aren't experiencing that true life. I wonder... I wonder how many of us are looking for the living among the dead. We look to other people or things for life. We look to other people or things for purpose and joy. We look to our job, 
We look to our careers. We, we, we look to our kids, our grandkids. We look to our relationship, our spouse, our success, our GPA, our grandchildren. And they all fall short. Don't get me wrong. They, they, they give us life, but, but they were never meant or created to give us that which is true life. Amen? Like, that's not where we're supposed to search. I tell people all the time, I'm going to let you down. My kids are going to let me down. Your family members are going to let you down. Your spouse is going to let you down. That relationship that you wish you had is going to let you down. The only one who can give you true life is Jesus. Not that they can't give us life for a bit, but they're never meant to give you true life. Many of us are looking for true life in so many people and things that in and of themselves are what? Dead. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Why are we so prone to look for the living among the dead? I wonder, I wonder if that's what's keeping so many of us from experiencing the comeback that Jesus calls us to. The comeback that Jesus wants to give us in life. I wonder if the fact that we can't experience that has to do with the fact that we keep looking for the living among the dead. How many of you need a comeback story today? I got one. How many of you showed up to Easter service today and you said, man, I need so much more than just another Easter service. I'm just going through the motions. I'm going to be straight with you. I'm here because grandma drugged me here. <laughs> I got a drug problem. Every Sunday morning, I'm drugged to church, right? No. <laughs> I'm here because my wife wanted me here. I'm here because mom brought me here. I'm here because dad makes us go every week. How many of you need so much more than a church service this morning? How many of you need more than songs and sermons? Maybe the beginning of your comeback story starts with this question. Where am I looking for the living among the dead? You see, the end of this passage gets at me the most because Peter, who was probably the most, uh, probably one of the closest apostles to Jesus, um, is left completely confused, right? Of all the people that are supposed to believe in the resurrection, it was probably John and Peter. And Peter is left completely perplexed. At the end of the passage, it says this, Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb, bending over. He saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself, what had happened. I don't know about you, but, but when I read that passage, I get this image of, Jesus, uh, of Peter standing over these cloths of linen, right? I don't know if he's kneeling on the floor or if he's looking over, over a table that Jesus was laid on or a stone. I, I don't know exactly what the, the image is for you, but when I read that passage, I sit there and I imagine Peter just staring compl completely confused at the cloth. Who took him? Where did Jesus go? Why would they steal him? Why would they steal his body? Haven't they humiliated him enough? What happened to Jesus? You know why I think it was so easy for the disciples to doubt when the women came to them with the fact that they'd been approached by angels? I think it was so easy for them to doubt because they were still holding on to their proverbial strips of linen. They were still holding on to their doubts and their pain and their trial and their, tr their struggles, their insecurities. They were still holding on to Jesus' death. Let me ask you one more question. If we were to take these strips of linen and say that they represented the dead from which we so often look for life, what would your linen represent? Go ahead and just reach back behind you or in front of you and grab a, grab a strip of linen and just, just hold it in your hands for a second. Don't be taking somebody else's linen, y'all. Just look at that thing. 
What does your, your strip of linen, what does your strip of cloth represent? I mean, come on. What is it that you're searching for life in that's clearly dead, that's failing you? Is it your relationship? Your spouse? Is it your kids? Maybe it's your career or your success. Maybe that what is keeping you from your comeback story is that anxiety that you're subconsciously giving into every week, every day that's, that's preventing you from getting out of bed. Is it your career, your success? Maybe it's the next drink, the next high. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Why do you look for the living among the dead? You've tried it and I've tried it. We, we know it doesn't work. You're proverbially just beating your head against the wall and the pain continues to, to engulf you and, and, and take over you. You and I both know it's not bringing you life. The Apostle Paul said this in Romans. He said, if the spirit who, who, of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. We don't, we don't celebrate Easter because of Jesus' death. We celebrate it because of his resurrection. We celebrate it because of the life that Christ wants to give you. We celebrate it because Jesus loves you and because that tomb was empty. And I wonder how many of us this morning need to experience that life. You see, here at the bridge, we believe that following Jesus makes our lives better and makes us better at life. And I don't know where you're at in your faith. I don't, I don't know if you're like, hey, I'm still trying to figure out who this Jesus guy is. Or you're like, you know what? I don't believe in Jesus. Or, or hey, I'm not sure about it, but I'm wrestling and, I, and I'm glad I'm, I showed up today because I, I got a little, at least a little taste of who he is. But, but no matter where you're at, I, I'm just going gonna, gonna to encourage you, even if you don't believe him, just give him a shot. Just give Jesus a shot because he, we believe that, that he raised from the grave. And let, let me tell you, if he can raise from the grave, he can raise you from yours. Amen? amen. Let me hear you. Amen? amen? Jesus can raise us from the grave this morning. And I wonder if he's asking you to let go of that which is dead. So what I want you to do, this is what we're going to do. We're, we're going to take our cloths, and I just want you to look at that cloth, and I want you to, to, to ask yourself, what does this cloth represent for me? And I don't know, maybe you're here today, and you would say, I, I've been living for Jesus for a long time, Rob. I'll be honest with you. I laid my cloth down a long time ago. Man, then, then, then I want you to do this exercise in celebration. This is a reminder, man, I... I'm no longer looking for the living among the dead. Maybe you're here today and you said, man, Rob, I, I thought I was looking for the living among the living, but, but, but I found out I wasn't and, I, and I'm, I'm done with that. And I, and I want to start looking for the living among he who still lives. Amen? And you need to just take your cloth and you need to come forward. And, and what I want you to do is before you come forward, I just want you to look at that cloth and, and just say a small prayer. Surrender that which this cloth represents over to God. And then take it and throw it at the cross. That which represents death. Ask to say, Jesus, I'm, I, I'm, gonna not, I'm not gonna be like Peter. I'm not gonna be like the apostles. I'm not gonna hold on to my cloth. I'm gonna let go and I'm gonna walk out of the tomb and I'm not gonna walk out of the tomb like Peter confused. I'm gonna walk out of the tomb in victory over Satan, sin, and death, and I'm done searching for the living among the dead. So we're going to stand together, and we're going to sing. And Justin's going to do an awesome spoken word. It's going to be really powerful. And, and, and what I want to encourage you to do is just, just hold on to that cloth and say a small prayer. When you're ready, come lay it at the foot of the cross. Let's give it over to him who is risen. Amen?
Amen. Let me pray for you as you stand. Heavenly Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to experience you each and every day. God, I pray today that people's lives would be surrendered over to you. I pray today that, they, that those that do not know your son Jesus would ask for forgiveness of their sins, just like I had to ask for mine and everybody else. And Lord, honestly, repentance is a daily thing. The Bible says the sacrifices of you, the sacrifices of God, are a humble and contrite heart. That means that every day we're surrendering our lives over to you. Every day we're asking for forgiveness. Every day we're living a repentant life. Not that we live in an insecure salvation, but Lord, that, that we just want to make sure that we're right with you. Lord, I pray that as we lay these pieces of cloth at the foot of the cross, that we would stop looking for the living among the dead. That we would have victory, true victory over Satan, sin, and death, and that we would pursue you with all of our hearts. That this just wouldn't be another Easter Sunday, but that, that we would pursue you throughout the coming weeks and give you a shot. Because you are the only one that can give us true life. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.